this beautiful day. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to all of you here to First Christian Reformed Church of South Holland. We have braved the elements. Psalm 147 reminds us that God sends the snow like wool. It reminds us of his power. We're here to worship the one who made the snow. Uh, Perhaps more fitting this morning, Psalm 51, uh, we're reminded that our sins will be forgiven and God will wash us. He will make us uh, whiter than the snow. We are here to celebrate and to remember the gospel and to uh, live into the life-transforming power of the gospel. And so we are glad to do that this morning. Welcome, especially if you're visiting with us. We're glad you could join us. And this is a humble house of prayer. We gather around the Word of God each and every week, and we thank Him for the things that He has done. A few announcements before we begin this morning. The first is that we have an all-church potluck next Sunday, and so sign-up sheets are there in the back, uh, in the narthex. You're welcome, even if, uh, even if you can't bring a dish, please come and join us for a time of food and fellowship. And uh, Corey Buchanan of Chicagoland Prison Outreach is going to give us a ministry update and all the things that are going on there uh, with, C- with CPO. And he's going to be joining us uh, during the worship service as well and give us a shorter update during the worship service and then more of an expanded update uh, during the potluck. So we hope that you can join us for that. And uh, then if you are a singer and interested in joining an Easter cantata, there's information there uh, in your bulletin. Uh, they're practicing beginning February 20th at Linwood URC, so there's information there. We have our swap youth group tonight at uh, 7 p.m. and uh, elders meeting tomorrow, so please be aware of that, all of our elders. With that, we are ready to begin our worship service. Uh, we are glad, joyful to join together in worship and song. Our God is holy, He is righteous, He is powerful. With all of that in mind, let's bow our heads for a time of silent prayer and reflection as we come together in worship this morning. Amen. Our call to worship is from Psalm 99. It's a responsive reading printed in your bulletins. Uh, Please take that out, and if you're able, please stand. We'll read this as a responsive reading together. I'll read the pastor's line, and then we'll respond with one voice. Hear from God's word as he calls us to worship. The Lord reigns. Let the nations tremble. He sits enthroned between the cherubim. Let the earth shake. Great is the Lord in Zion. He is exalted over the nations. Let them praise your great and awesome name. He is holy. Amen, brothers and sisters. Let's respond together in song. Sing number 194. Jehovah reigns in majesty. Remain standing. Sing all all three verses.
Amen, brothers and sisters. Our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of the heavens and the earth. He greets us with his grace and calls us his own. Receive his greeting. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and the operation of his Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. This is God's world. It is not our own, and we have come to remind ourselves of that and to to go into a time of reminding ourselves of God's holiness and coming before him in confession and then thanksgiving for the forgiveness that we have. This is an important part of our spiritual lives to teach ourselves about this rhythm of uh, reminding ourselves who God is and living in light of that, uh, confessing our sins to him, not just week by week, but day by day and resting in the finished work of the gospel. So let us take a few moments, uh, the next few minutes, and do that. And for our reading of the law, I'd like to read from Psalm 24. Psalm 24, which in many ways uh, teaches us uh, about the importance of worshiping and communing with God, uh, but also the fact that uh, in our imperfections, in all of our sinfulness, we cannot dwell with God in and of ourselves. We need his help. So here from God's word, Psalm 24, it says this, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust an idol or swear by a false god, they will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God their Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, O God of Jacob. Amen. May God bless the reading of his word. We see there in verse 4 that the one who has clean hands and a pure heart is the one who may ascend the mountain of the Lord. And this morning, let that remind you of the words of David where he prays to God, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. As we uh, turn to this prayer of confession, it's printed in our bulletins. Let us pray this together as we read it and as we not just read the words, but allow our hearts and our minds uh, to dwell on, on this, this prayer that God might come and minister to our souls. We have erred and we need God's forgiveness the first time we turn to him and each day after that. So let us pray this prayer of confession together. Almighty God, we acknowledge and confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. We have not loved you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. Deepen within us our sorrow for the wrong we have done and the good we have left undone. Lord, you are full of compassion and grace, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. There is always forgiveness with you. Restore to us the joy of your salvation. Bind up that which is broken. Give light to our minds, strength to our wills, and rest to our souls. Speak to each of us and let your word abide with us until it has wrought in us your holy will. Amen. Amen. Assurance of grace this morning comes from Ephesians 2, and uh, we, we always read a, a gospel promise from the scriptures that we might rest in it, that we, we might be reminded of the fact that we are to look to Christ, and indeed that if anyone has not looked to Christ and trusted in him, that they may hear this call and do so. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. The message of salvation in Scripture is that we are saved by grace, saved because of what Christ has done, 
And so look to Him. Look to Jesus Christ, our Savior. If you seek salvation in Him and in Him alone, there is forgiveness, there is salvation in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The wonderful message of Scripture, of course, is that it does not end there. God calls us to live a life of obedience to Him. In fact, we read in the next verse of Ephesians 2 that we are God's workmanship. We are that which He fashions and He makes and He forms. We are created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So I'm going to read a few verses from later on in Ephesians in chapter 5 to remind ourselves of God's will for us. It says this, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you, as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is, an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them. And here's the promise for us. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true, and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Amen. May God add his blessing to his word. We are saved, as I said earlier, by grace. Let us have a time now of giving thanksgiving to God for that. Let us affirm our faith together and then respond in song. We have an affirmation of faith printed in our bulletin as well. If you're able, let us stand again as we come together to give thankfulness for the gospel. This is taken, from, of course, from our catechism. Let us say these words together. Why do we say that by faith alone we are right with God? It is not because of any value my faith has that God is pleased with me. Only Christ's satisfaction righteousness and holiness make me right with God and I can receive this righteousness and make it my own in no other way than by faith alone amen if you take your insert we have this hymn complete in thee we're complete in Christ our salvation is sure in him let's remain standing sing all four of these verses
seated. One of the lifelong spiritual battles that we have is is fighting to to trust in God and to to see His hand in all things and and to see Him as a good and a loving Father, even in the midst of of things that we don't fully understand. God answers prayer in various ways and and all different circumstances sort of force us to think about things uh, differently, depending on when we're going through hard times or, or good times, times without much pain or suffering. This week, uh, we saw sort of all different things come together. Um, reasons for rejoicing. Our sister Martha Blau uh, was taken to her eternal home, and she had been suffering, particularly in the last days, and, uh, and God called her home. Oftentimes, we, we pray um, for healing, and we pray that God would, uh, would fix things, that we might uh, live more on this earth Sometimes he answers that prayer by giving his people something even better. And uh, he, called, he called Martha home now, who now is healthier than all of us. She's more alive than all of us. She fully knows her God more than we do now. And all of those things are reasons for rejoicing. Sometimes God answers prayer and we see uh, miraculous healing uh, in this life and on this earth. Think of Cal and Mary Coster's daughter, Janet Van Clay, who I'm not a doctor. I don't know all the medical details. Basically, all I know is that very, very few people survive what she has survived. And uh, late in the week, I believe Thursday or Friday, they were sitting at the table in their house and Janet walked through the door and, and uh, they were, Cal and Mary were shocked even to see her, but she was released from the hospital last I had heard. And so that's a wonderful answer to prayer. Sometimes God um, seems to, to be absent from answering our prayers and, and things remain the same. That's been how it is for, um, for our brother Dale and, and the Terhar family. Um, Dale was brought home from the hospital this week and then last night um, things were, um, he was just struggling physically, you know, couldn't, couldn't get out of his wheelchair at all and, and he was um, rushed back to the hospital again and talking with Nancy overnight and this morning they've just found more bleeding on his brain and and it's just been a, a really a really hard cycle that keeps repeating itself and a lot of pain a lot of um, a lot of questioning and just wondering what God is doing and where he is in all of it and and that sort of gives us a taste of human life right sometimes God answers prayers in the best way sometimes it seems like we keep waiting and waiting and waiting what is he going to do um, and that's where we find ourselves in, in multiple of these situations. Let's uh, bring our concerns to God. Uh, he says that we are to pray to Him out of thanksgiving, out of love and trust to Him, and, and we know that He hears our prayers. So let us uh, offer then our own ministry of prayer and intercession this morning as we come to our great God, and let it be a blessing to all of us, and may we join together um, in praying for our church and for the church around the world, and for our people who are in need. Let us pray. Gracious God, you have loved us. You have chosen us to be a royal priesthood and to offer you spiritual sacrifices. So, Father, we come to you this morning in the ministry of prayer and intercession. Gracious Lord God, you have called us out of darkness into your marvelous light. We bless you for the rock of your salvation, which is solid and sure and steadfast. That we are justified in Christ, forgiven of every sin and declared to be righteous. And Father, by your abiding presence through your Holy Spirit, we are sanctified and formed more and more into the image of your Son. To be obedient sons and daughters who... Seek your glory in all things and seek the exaltation of your name in our lives. Father, we pray for your church. We pray for this church founded on the rock of Christ. Grant that we might be a congregation firmly established in Christ, built up in Christ, performing the work of Christ, and filled 
with the love of Christ. We pray these things, Father, for you have called us and chosen us to be a royal priesthood and a holy nation. We pray for the ministers and the pastors of our community and in Chicagoland and in the, wor- in the world. Father, we pray for those who may be very much like us in a lot of their distinctives. We pray for others who may have many differences. We pray that you would feed your people with your word today. And Father, we may see the greatness of what you are doing in calling your people to yourself from every corner of the earth, every tribe and tongue and nation, for you have chosen us to be a holy nation, a royal priesthood, a nation called out from the nations, a a people called out from the peoples. And so we pray for all peoples and all nations. We think of the wonderful reformed church planning that is going on throughout the world. We think of that which is going on in Asia, in South Korea. We think of the people within our own congregation, the Burmese people who are seeking to plant uh, churches within our denomination. Father, would you bless evangelists and pastors who are seeking to further your kingdom and build your people up. We pray for Uh, Much of the work that's going on with short-term missions and many of the ways in which your people are seeking out ways to, uh, to bless others in the name of Jesus. Would you guide them in wisdom and the the many issues that can arise with those trips? Father, we pray for the the group of Ileana students that's about to go to Uganda here in just a number of weeks. We pray for their safety. Father, we pray that it might be a blessing to them. Father, we pray for the people of Uganda that the gospel might be made known in that land. We thank you for all that you continue to do in our lives. We think of the blessing of seeing Cal and Mary's daughter uh, be released from the hospital. And Father, we pray for an ongoing uh, recovery and health. Father, we thank you for calling our sister Martha to her eternal home. Father, our hearts break and we are confused. uh, And we just look to you. We lay it at your feet with uh, the, the situation of our brother Dale. And uh, Father, we we know not all the things that you are doing. You are painting on a canvas far too big for us to see. So strengthen their faith, Father. Uh, We know that as your word says, you know the way that we take. When you are finished, we shall come forth as gold. And so strengthen the faith of our brother. Assure him of your love. Assure him of your grace and your presence upon him. And that which you have called him to go through, Father, may he, may he receive it as coming from your hand. Uh, may he resolve to look to you in all things and to rest in Christ and to know that even as the strength of his body fails, he is a perfect and a strong and a loving Savior. You have called us to holiness, Father. We bless you for the promise that one day we will be perfect even as you are perfect. We pray that you might fulfill our vocation, that we might accomplish the work that you have given to us. We pray for those who feel little to no joy in their work. Remind them that they serve you, the only God. To you be all glory, gracious gracious Lord God, for we rejoice in the service you call us to perform. In Christ, our great high priest, we pray who lives and who reigns at your right hand, through the power of your Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. We'll take our offering this morning, brothers and sisters, first for the Christian Education Fund, and the second for Christian Schools International.
Let us sing once more a song of preparation before our sermon this morning. It's the other side of your insert and your bulletins, uh, ancient words. Um, Let's stand together and uh, sing these words together as we prepare to hear from God's holy word. Isaiah chapter 44, we'll also be reading from Romans chapter 5. Normally we do our confession catechism sermons in the evening, but we've been doing some switches lately, and I just uh, thought we'd do it once again this morning as we think about Article 8 of the Belgic Confession This is not going to be a a sermon showing the the many ways where, or the many places where Scripture proves to us the doctrine of the Trinity. That actually happens in Article 9. Today, what I'd rather do is to think about the, our God being triune and how that teaches us about His purpose for which He created the world and uh, how we live according to that purpose. So we'll be thinking about that relative to our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let's read from this passage in Isaiah, showing us that there is one God, one and only. We'll read verses 6 through 8. This is what the Lord says, Israel's King and Redeemer, the Lord Almighty. I am the first and I am the last. Apart from me, there is no God. Who then is like me? Let him proclaim it. Let him declare and lay out before me what has happened since I established my ancient people and what is yet to come. Yes, let him foretell what will come. Do not tremble. Do not be afraid. Did I not proclaim this and foretell it long ago? You are my witnesses. Is there any God besides me? No. There is no other rock. I know not one. Amen. Then if you would turn over to the book of Romans. Chapter 5, this will be on page 
1752, if you're using the Pew Bible in front of you. The one God who determined to save his people. Let us hear and give attention to the reading of God's word once again. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not disappoint us, because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, whom he has given us. The grass withers, the flower fades, God's word endures forever. Amen. Let me read Article 8 of our Confession. As we will consider this today, again, the one God is one in essence, but distinguished in three persons. Here, the, the language that our confession gives to us regarding this wonderful, glorious truth. According to this truth and this word of God, we believe in one only God, who is the one single essence in which are three persons, really, truly, and eternally distri- distinct according to their incommunicable properties, namely, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Father is the cause, origin, and beginning of all things visible and invisible. The Son is the Word, wisdom, and image of the Father. The Holy Spirit is the eternal power and might proceeding from the Father and the Son. Nevertheless, God is not by this distinction divided into three, since the Holy Scriptures teach us that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit have each his personality, distinguished by their properties, but in such wise that these three persons are but one, only God. Hence, then, it is evident that the Father is not the Son, nor the Son the Father, and likewise the Holy Spirit is neither the Father nor the Son. Nevertheless, these persons thus distinguished are not divided nor mixed, for the Father has not assumed the flesh, nor has the Holy Spirit, but the Son only. The Father has never been without his Son or without his Holy Spirit, for they are all three co-eternal and co-essential, There is neither first nor last, for they are all three one, in truth, in power, in goodness, and in mercy. Let us consider this God together and what it teaches us about how we are to live our lives and how we are to serve him. Imagine living a thousand years ago. And you go outside and and you look into the sky either during the day or night and Nothing would have seemed more obvious in that moment than the fact that the the stars and the sun and the moon all moved together in beautiful orbit around the earth, an earth that would have seemed very flat in that moment as well. The sun perhaps would have seemed very small compared to the earth along with the stars. The irony, of course, is that this is not the reality at all. The sun is much bigger than the earth, we orbit around it and not vice versa. In this, we find a, a bit of an analogy to uh, a, a way of thinking that many people can be drawn into, uh, particularly in our age. In our age, there is perhaps nothing more ultimate, nothing more central to the way people think, the way people live, than the self. The self is at the center of it all, and everything must revolve, must orbit around that. This is a mindset, a perhaps worldview, if you would like, that robs people of the true message which is declared to us in God's word, and that is that all things exist for God, all things revolve and orbit around him, and human beings can live to the fullest, that they can flourish most fully when their hearts are tuned to that wonderful and glorious truth. If all things revolve, if all things orbit around God, if he is the measure of all things, then it is to him we must go to find out our purpose for existing, to find out why he created the world, why he created us, the best way to live our lives for him. So, why were we and all things created? For God and for his glory. He is the highest 
good. He is the highest good. And this morning I'd like to think about God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and how the wonderful doctrine of the Trinity teaches us uh, deeper things about the ultimate purposes of God and how God involves us as his people, in his wonderful mission of glorifying his name, the exaltation of his name, which is the reason for which, the ultimate purpose for which he created all things. And that must become, brothers and sisters, the central and ultimate goal of our lives, the glory, the magnifying, the exaltation of God. God is seeking willing participants in that mission of glorifying his name. But we need to start by understanding that there is nothing better for our souls, there is nothing better for our persons than orbiting around God and having him as the center of it all. He is the highest good and we need to begin day by day taking steps to live in line with that truth. We read in Isaiah 44, this is what the Lord says, Israel's king and redeemer, the Lord Almighty, I am the first and I am the last. Apart from me there is no God. He ends this passage by saying, is there any God besides me? No, there is no other rock. I know not one. Thus, fundamentally, what we see in Scripture is this. This is how we have stated it throughout the ages. God is the only necessary being. What does that mean? That means that all other things that exist other than God don't necessarily need to exist. God is the only necessary being. All things are derived from him. All things are dependent upon him and his word and his life-giving power. It is only God who is the necessary being. Secondly, this, and this is kind of captures centrally what we're considering today. Everything exists for God. Everything exists for God. Psalm 148, it's a wonderful psalm that celebrates this as as a song of praise to God, that everything exists for Him. We see at the beginning of the psalm, praise the Lord, praise the Lord from the heavens, praise Him in the heights. And then it goes on to say in verse 7, praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures in all the deeps. So from the highest heights to the deepest deepest depths, let everything praise the Lord. And then at the end of the psalm, it says, Young men and maidens together, old men and children, let them praise the name of the Lord. All all human beings are to give praise to our God. Why? For his name alone is exalted. His majesty is above earth and above the heavens. God made everything for a distinct purpose. In Proverbs 16, the Lord has made everything for its purpose. And we see that that is for God. Everything exists for him. He created this world for a distinct aspect of his purposes, and that is his glory. His glory. That's why he created the world. In Isaiah 48, we read this. For my own sake, I do it. For how should my name be profaned? My glory I will not give to another. God will not share his glory with anyone. He is the first, and he is the last. In Isaiah 43, we read that he creates human beings for his glory. When Jesus comes to earth, he expands on this idea. And and this shows us really a fascinating way in which Jesus Christ teaches us about the Trinity. Because in all the places where he talks about the Father glorifying the Son, we need to be reminded of that place in Isaiah where God says, My glory I will not share with another. So Jesus says in John 13, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in Him. If God is glorified in Him, God will also glorify Him in Himself and glorify Him at once. God creates all things for His glory. His glory He will not share with another. When the Son, Jesus Christ, comes to earth, He says, The Father is glorifying me. It gives us this fascinating glimpse into the fact that Jesus shares with God, with his Father, in his divinity, in being God. And yet there is this other fascinating aspect of their distinction. One in essence, one in substance, but three in persons. So if God is the center of human life, We must do various things to live in accordance with that truth. And the Bible talks about this as those who are redeemed in Christ are restored to this original purpose of God of glorifying him. And so listen to the way 
in which we see uh, the New Testament talk about all of these things. We must uh, first use our bodies for the glory of God. Use our bodies for the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 6, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, but you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. We are to use our bodies for the glory of God. Too often we can get caught up in thinking that uh, the, the gospel is a message for the salvation of our souls. And we forget that the one who created the soul created the body as well and created a unity of, of person within that body and soul duality. That we need to serve God not only with our minds, not only with resting in him for the salvation of our souls, we need to use our bodies to glorify him. Secondly, we are to do good works that glorify him. In 1 Peter 2, we read this, Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. God says, no matter what people are saying about you, no matter what ways in which the people of God are persecuted, you must put the glory of God in the center of your life, and you must make that your greatest aim, to obey him, so that if anyone does persecute you, revile you, as what Jesus says, right? That... They, that will work towards the glory of God, whether in the way that we convince them of the truth of God's message in the way that we live, or whether on the day of visitation when God comes to vindicate his name and he says, see, my people lived for my glory. My people lived to serve me. So we are to do good, good works that glorify God. Thirdly, we are to glorify God in all things, from the simple to the complex, all things of our life, we are to, to have this in our minds and in our hearts that we live, we exist for the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 10, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Simple, as simple as it gets, eating, drinking, whatever we do, we are to do all for the glory of God. 1 Peter chapter 4, a little bit more, uh, not the, the simple things, a little more complex. Peter says, whatever uh, however the Spirit has gifted you to serve the people of God, however He has fashioned you and formed you, created your passions out of His sanctifying you, use that for the good of God's people so that God may be glorified. He says this, As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And this is a key point to understand. We talk about the, the majesty of the glory of God and how God calls everyone to it. And, and so often we can, uh, we can be led into thinking that that necessarily means that if you live for the glory of God, you need to live in some kind of radical circumstance. You need to move to, to Venezuela or to Africa or to Asia and, and serve God in, in the most adventurous of places. And some people are called to that. Some people are called to that. But most of God's people will be called to live very, on the surface, ordinary lives, won't they? They will have ordinary jobs, ordinary vocations, not called to live radical lives in radical circumstances, but to live ordinary lives, and here's the key distinction, ordinary lives marked by a radical devotion to God, a radical devotion to God in everything from the mundane to the complex, in ordinary circumstances for those who are called to live in radical circumstances, wherever God places you. And most people, it will seem fairly mundane, fairly ordinary. We live ordinary lives marked by radical devotion to God. We think about all of this, the way the truths of God's word and the way that this matches up against modern mindsets, modern secular mindsets. The early Christian thinker, Augustine, talked about all of the world being divided into two cities, the city of God, the city of man. The city of God is all those people whose lives center around God, and they try to see the self decrease more and more and more. Like John the Baptist, who would say, he must increase, but I must decrease. That's those in the city of God. The city of man are, are those who have the, the exaltation of the self at the center of their lives, and their picture of God decreases more and more and more. See, the glory of God, what we need to understand, the glory of God, that is not good news to a lot of people. 
They hear this centrality of of God and how we are to live in a God-centered way. To even hear something like God himself is God-centered. God is working for the purposes of his own glory. And that's not good news to a lot of people. There's a, a poem that I think captures that mentality, and I quote it from time to time. It, it matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. This view of life that you're on a boat, and, and that boat you're, of your existence, you're the one driving it. You're the one putting wind in, in the sails. You're the one that's putting the ballast in the boat of your own determination and your own, your own uh, self-realization. What does the Bible say? That all that's wrong. You are not the master of your fate. You are not the captain of your soul. If your life would be likened to a boat, what is the wind in your sails? It's the truth of God. It's the, it's the glory of God that that would be what drives you. That that would be the ballast in your boat to keep you from tipping over. That whatever you're, you're hit with in life, whatever circumstances you face, the ballast in your boat is that I live for the glory of God. That I live for His purposes. That I live for His exaltation. Laying in the hospital bed and not seeing the purposes behind it. You live for the highest being. He has called you to this, to do what is good. He is the center And God will be glorified whether human beings assent to that truth or not. But this brings to mind for many people an objection to say, the God you're you're talking about sounds selfish. He sounds narcissistic. He sounds self-centered. The very very things that, that most of us know in our lives we need to strive to not be. Don't be centered upon yourself. Don't do things only out of concern for yourself. And people will say, so is God selfish? Is God narcissistic? So we'll take some, a few moments to answer that objection. We consider this. Since God is infinitely great, since God is the greatest and the highest being, we know in and of ourselves that we should live for him and we should live according to the truth that he is the highest being, right? That seems like very basic elementary for us. We, we know that God is the highest being. We know that he is the most exalted, that he is higher than us. He is more powerful than us. We are to live and to serve him. So what would it be like if God who knows all things, if God who knows all truth, if he did not live in accordance with that truth? See, if God is the highest good, if he is the greatest being there is, he must act and live in accordance with that truth. God must ultimately be the center of his own concerns because of who he is, right? If God were motivated by the exaltation, ultimately, of anything other than himself, that would become his God. As God, he must love himself supremely, As his creatures, we must love him supremely and love ourselves in a subordinate way. If we love anything other than God supremely, that is idolatry for us. But then think about it relative to God. If God loves anything more than himself, that would be equal to idolatry for him. So it's God living and acting in accordance with the truth that he is the highest being. He is the greatest good. And he must act and live in accordance with it. Yet... Yet, because God is triune, God is Father and Son and Holy Spirit, we see that his love, even his love within himself, it is not selfish, it is not self-centered, it is not turned completely inward. God's loving and his concern for himself is the love shared between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. It is a generous love. It is an outward love. It is a communing love. The fellowship of the Trinity is an eternal reality. Right? We read in our confession, the Father has never been without his Son or without his Holy Spirit, for they are all three co-eternal and co-essential. There was never a time where the Father was not the Father of the Son. There was never a time when the Father was the only person that existed in God. They all three are the same in substance, equal in power and glory. One God, now and forever. Amen. The mystery of this is that When we ponder God's unity, 
when we ponder the fact that he is the only God, that leads us to consider that he is three in persons. His unity leads us to ponder his tri-personhood. But when we think about the three persons, we are led to the thought of his unity. So they're not in contradictory. Uh, they're not in contradiction. They uh, exist in concert for us to adore the majesty of God. So God is forever in communion and in perfect love with himself. If God were one person and not three, we would have a harder time seeing how he is not selfish, not self-centered. But within the relationship of the Trinity, our triune God, there's a mutual love. As the Father delights in the Son, we see this all throughout the life of Jesus. The Father delights in the Son. When Jesus is baptized, the voice from heaven, the Mount of Transfiguration, this is my beloved Son. In him I am well pleased. That the Father loves the Son in John 3 and has given all things into his hand. The Father shows him all the things that he is doing. The Father takes great delight in the Son. There's this outward-facing, generous love. Secondly, the Son delights in submitting to the authority and teaching of the Father's will. In John 10, we read this. For this reason, the words of Jesus, For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. Jesus took great delight in submitting to the Father's will in doing what the Father had sent him to do. And then the Spirit is the person, not just the force. The, Spirit, uh, the Holy Spirit is not a force within God. He is the person that brings beauty and meaning and communion and love within God himself. He is the personal love between the Father and the Son. So there is this mutual, generous giving love turned outward in our triune God. And since he is the highest and greatest being, he must act and live in a way that accords with that truth. So finally, how God involves his people in his mission for his glory. And this is where we consider this for ourselves. It coalesces perfectly the, the, the doctrine of the Trinity with redemption. Romans 5, therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, character hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. This passage, perhaps you noticed, is Trinitarian, isn't it? We have peace with God, that is, the Father. Peace with the Father through the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then God's love is poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit given to us. And, and the, the, the wonderful truth of that last part of our passage, the, tr the love that is poured into our hearts, is that that is God's outward-facing, generous, giving love, which he decides to share with his creatures, the love and the fellowship, the communion that is eternal and that was forever existing within God. He shares with his creatures to bring them into eternal blessedness, which has always been in himself. God didn't need to create the world, but he took great delight to not only create, but to redeem his people who had wandered from him. We see this in Christ and who he is. He is God and man, two natures brought together. They're not mixed together, right? When we are brought into fellowship and communion with God, we don't become divine ourselves. We remain distinct. But we're brought into this close fellowship and communion through Christ and through the goodness and the grace of God. But it's not just who Christ is that teaches us about, it, about this. It's what he has done, right? Romans 5 will go on to say, at just the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Thus, it's not only that he is the God-man, but what the God-man does in dying to redeem God's people from their sins. In Romans 5, verse 2, a uh, couple words I'd like for us to consider. We have obtained access. Access. Now, that suggests what? That because of Christ, we are somewhere now that we were not before. And where is that? 
That's in blessedness, in communion, in love with God by His grace. He welcomes us to Himself. We have been granted access to be with Him in this new way, to enjoy the the life-giving power of God, that eternal blessedness and love that was shared between the three persons of the Trinity from all eternity. Not only do we have access, but it says that we stand. We stand, just like that song that we sang this morning, complete in thee, I shall stand. We do not cower, we do not run away, we do not hide from God, but we stand because what we have is certain through the work of Jesus. And what is all of it for? What is this redemption, this wonderful message of grace, this being brought into love and communion with God, what is it for? It's for the glory and the exaltation of God. Consider this passage from Ephesians chapter 1. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace. Jesus Christ died for sinners. But in an even more ultimate way, Jesus Christ died for the praise of the glory of God's grace, that his name, the one name of God, might be exalted and magnified throughout all of the world for all eternity. The question before us today, brothers and sisters, is are we going to live into that mission of God, the glorification of his name? He wants willing participants to know and to live in accordance with this truth. We flourish most when God is the orbit of our souls. And thus we praise him in this, that the God who is eternal in might and beauty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the one who acts for his own glory, he glorifies himself as he saves us from our sins. And in being saved and being redeemed and being renewed and brought into having access into this grace in which we stand. God is seeking willing participants to live for his glory. This passage in Romans 5 ties it all together in these wonderful ways where it says this, we rejoice in the hope of what? Of the glory of God. We rejoice in the hope of of the glory of God. Make that your aim because that is the purpose for which God created all things. So we must know that God's glory is to become the central hope, the central aspiration of our lives. He is the highest good. We must know that and we must assent to that truth. But even even more important perhaps than that is that we would delight in that we would love the glory of God as what is most ultimate. That's a distinction for us to think about this morning. Do we know that the glory of God is God's purpose for his, for his creating all things? That it's his, his purpose that he is pursuing in the world? Yes, do we know it? But do we love it? Do we delight in it? What do you want to be the center of your life? And what is the center of your life? Things for us to consider this morning. We do not need to go to Africa or Asia to live in radical devotion to God. Some people will, and that's a wonderful truth. Some people will be called to those more radical circumstances, but all of us are called to live with a radical devotion to God. And in doing so, we must become dependent upon God's grace, right? God's grace allows us to stand in his power And in his goodness, we must become dependent upon God's grace that we might emulate his concern for his glory in all circumstances. See, that's, we're called to live in a way that emulates God. God lives for his own glory and is seeking willing participants in the mission of his glory to bring us along to live for the glory of his name. And in doing so, we are emulating him. We are living the way that God lives for the glory of the only God, for the glory of the triune God. So Paul says, not only so, not only do we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God, but we rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not disappoint us or it does not put us to shame. It does not shame us. Why? Hope 
You, you walk through this world with an unshakable, with a powerful, spirit-wrought hope resting in the grace of God, ballast in your boat, saying, no matter what comes my way, my boat's not capsizing. I'm going forward for the glory of God. I'm living for Him. That will not shame us. Why? Because God has poured out His love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom He has given to us. In other words, that life That life-giving power of God is poured into our hearts. And if God has brought us into that fellowship, into that communion, we know that that is something we will never, we will never stop enjoying from this time forward into eternity. The love of God, which he has poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Live for the magnification, the exaltation the glory of God. Let that be the wind in your sails. Let that be the ballast in your boat. Let God be the master of your fate, the captain of your soul, because you have been redeemed in Christ. Live for him and for his glory. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the matchless name of God. One God, now and forever. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for being the only God. We come to you in the name of Christ, your Son. and Father, we don't understand always the, the deepest truths of who you are, but we would believe that we would understand more. We don't understand to believe, but we believe to understand. So grant us grace to know you more and to rejoice in what you do for us and And how you remind us every day of your grace. Help us rest in the gospel of Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Number 100 in the red hymnal. Holy, holy, holy. Stand together and sing all four verses.
Amen. Have a great day in Christ. Receive God's benediction. Now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, for all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.